Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be about creating a web comic page in Clips of Pain presented by January Sun or JCR. Before we begin the webinar, there are some housekeeping items I would like to go through. This webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. There will be a Q&A session, question and answer session during the last, in the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Attendees can ask questions in the GoToWebinar question box right away. Due to time constraints, not all questions will be answered. This webinar will be recorded and the recording will be shared on social media and, and sent via email to all registrants and attendees. The panelists for this webinar are Manu Quinones, myself, Joanna Brower, in January Sun, also known as JCR. For those of you who connect with us for the very first time or have never heard about Clip Studio Paint, Clip Studio Paint is your all-in-one solution for stunning, ready-to-publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. Learn more at clipstudio.net forward slash n and graphicsly.com. Also, we'd like to invite you to share uh, this webinar through your Instagram stories. We'll be sharing your Instagram stories if you tag us as hashtag webinar at JCR, at graphicsly, at Wacom, and at Cliff Studio Official. Jerry Sun is a designer and freelance artist who has worked in various animated shows and dwells in Vancouver. She's the creator of The Reaper and The Wedding, which won the 2021 Best Webcomic Award from Sequential Magazine. January is currently creating Bailin and Lee Young. Uh, Young and the story of Lang Wen, both on webtoons. So with that, I will leave you with January and her webinar, Creating a Webcomic Page with Clip Studio Paint. Thank you so much. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, thank you for attending this webinar. I'm January, also known as JSR on my social media. Uh, today I'm going to be showing you my process for creating a short web comic using Clip Studio Paint. So this is a summary of what I'm going to go through for today's uh, webinar. So let me start with a short introduction of myself. Um, I'm a designer in the animation industry. Um, what I specifically do is I design environments and sets for animated shows. Um, I've also done color keying and digital map paintings for 3D shows. Uh, so this is a couple of examples from uh, environments that I've done in a previous show called Last Kids on Earth. Um, and during my off time, I like to draw a lot of comics. Um, visual storytelling is something I'm really passionate about because it's like, I'm showing people a whole new world that I basically made up from nothing, right? It's kind of like playing God without the consequences. Um, one thing you can see is that in my personal art, I don't draw a lot of backgrounds because I do that so much during my work. So I don't really like to touch backgrounds. Um, and in my off time, I, yeah, so I draw a lot of comics and these are two um, web comics that I am currently working on and I will show you in this webinar my process for creating my um, web comics. So I usually like to start with thumbnails and then I will take you through my sketching and painting stages and then I will end up with a finished page which I will then show you how to turn into a webtoon format like this. Okay, so uh, this is just an example from Violin and Li Yun. I'm going to be drawing a completely different comic for today's demo. So before I start drawing anything, I need inspiration. I need to know what to draw, right? I'm not the kind of artist that can just improvise on a blank page. I need a lot of planning before I can even do my first stroke. So a couple of weeks ago, I was thinking, you know, what should I draw for this webinar, right? And like everyone else these days, when they're stuck, I go off for a run, and um, just kidding, I go on social media and I come across this really cool Chinese TikTok of um, these two lion dancers, right? So it was really, really cool to see just this one guy um, like holding around and, and swinging this other guy around like he weighs nothing. So 
I see this and I feel like this material here that I want to make a comic out of. So I know that I want to draw two lion dancers, but what is my comic going to be about? Um, so over the years, I've sort of realized that funny stories and sad stories, those two kinds of stories seem to leave the deepest impression in people. Because I don't feel like being depressing today, I'm going to try and make a uh, something, I'll try to make something funny out of this. So I need a prompt. How can I make this funny? Um, one idea that I came, uh, I came up with was, you know, something kind of silly, but you know, what if this guy, let's call him guy A, what if he's ticklish? He shouldn't be doing line dancing if he's ticklish, but let's say he was, it works for my comic. Let's say this is guy B. So um, now I have a prompt, guy A is ticklish. So then I can start kind of letting my brain play out what would happen if um, that was a um, that was a thing that A had a problem with. So then I start thumbnailing, which um, just want to say is really important. Thumbnailing is something that you should be doing regardless if you're doing illustrations or design or comics, because it's kind of like a roadmap to uh, where you want to end up. Like you wouldn't go on a big trip without planning out some of the uh, your road stops and stuff. Thumbnailing is kind of the same thing. So uh, I know that I want to set this up with um, like I want to set the, I want to set the scene where everyone immediately knows. Okay, there's two guys line dancing, right? So there, um, let's say there's like a, a costume here for like you will see this and immediately know they're line dancing. And I know I want to end this page on a panel where um, if A were to be ticklish, he would probably react, right? So I'm going to end with a panel where A is maybe kicking the other guy in the face. Um, so I would need a couple more panels in the middle to show the setup. So let's say there's a shot of guy B's hand on guy's waist. And then there's a close-up shot of guy A. And he's really surprised. Um, I probably need a few dialogue bubbles to show people what's happening. Um, usually, actually, I start with a script, but because this is such a short comic, I feel like I can probably leave the script for for later. Um, sometimes my brain will play out what happens afterwards. It will. Oh, my pen is frozen. Okay, so if my brain keeps playing out what happens, I will just keep thumbnailing. So after he gets kicked in the face, I would imagine that, I don't know, B recovers really quickly. And maybe he throws the other guy into the air. Just let your imagination run wild. And maybe he does some, I don't know, gymnastics or parkour through the, um, the I don't know what those are called, the stilts. And then he might end up in a position where he can catch guy A falling in a bridal carry. I don't know. Um, so at this point, I know, okay, so there's probably going to be a bit of romance in this, in this little comic. And um, something that's really common that I see in romance comic strips is there will be like a, like an, like a page where you see the two um, characters and then there's like two panels that show a close-up of the two characters' faces, right? Um, maybe they're both blushing. And this is like the easiest and probably the most cliche way of showing, okay, these two characters have something for each other. Um, and this is such a short comic, I will just go with that. Okay, so now I have an idea of what my uh, short comic is gonna look like. Um, and before I start sketching, I just want to go over something really quickly. Um, as you see, I've started with a traditional page format, right? Like I didn't start thumbnailing into Webtoon, even though 
I'm going to be showing you how to do the uh, converting this to the webtoon later. This is because it's so much easier to go from a traditional web page or sorry, traditional page um, comic to webtoon format than it is to go the other way around. And for someone like me who's really indecisive about where their projects are going to go, I want to leave myself with the room, the flexibility of having more options in the future. So I always start with uh, a traditional page um, thumbnails. If you know for sure your comic is only going to be living in the webtoon format and you're not going to print it or anything like that, then yes, go ahead and start doing it in the webtoon format. Uh, I prefer the traditional format, so um, we can start sketching now. So go to new. Um, there is a lot of options that Clip Studio uh, provides you for different kinds of projects you want. So we want comic. I'm just going to call this Lion Dance. Um, make sure it's saved into the correct folder or you'll have trouble finding it later. Um, as far as I can tell, in the comic format, I don't think you can change the units to like inches. You can do that for like illustrations, um, but not for comics. So all I know is A4 is probably the closest to eight and a half by 11 inches. So that's what I'm going to go with. Um, bleed, uh, North American standard, three millimeters is close to 0 0.125 inches. Highest resolution as possible. Um, I know that I want two pages. This part I'm not going to touch. Um, I don't really know what some of it is, but I've never had to use it. So then after you press OK, you will get something like this. So you open up the first page and you will see these crop marks. So I'm just going to quickly go over these uh, crop marks. So the outer crop mark is the bleed. So you, if you want a full bleed page, you want your art to touch at least this line. This is where your actual physical page will start, this inner border. So um, the printer will cut off this border. And then the inner box here is the margins. So that's where you want all of your important information to lie. So that includes um, you know, text bubbles, um, characters, et cetera. OK, so according to the thumbnail of my first page, I know that um, there's going to be two characters dancing here. And then my three panels are going to look like this. OK, so I usually set up my panels first as a template for, for my sketch. So you go over here, you see this um, uh, panel tool. And there's a lot of options for how you want to customize your panels. Um, the color on the, the first color of your color wheel over here is the uh, border color, your panel color. So I usually like working with a dark brown color. Um, you can choose to have it, you know, lineless without border. So you get something like this. Or um, this time I'm going to draw a border. So I'm just going to quickly fill it in. And then you can um, easily edit the parameters of your comic by pressing Control. And then you touch the border. And you can just drag your, um, your border around. There we go. So let's say I'm happy with this. And then I can start sketching right on top. So guy A, I want to have him. Um, my sketches are always, always really ugly. Uh, and let's see. I need to make sure that he is, it's really clear that he's lion dancing. So. Um, Instead of a practice that we saw in the uh, video, he is holding up the lion costume. Uh, I don't know how lion costumes look off the top of my head, so um, 
never be afraid to use references. Um, it's references are really important because it's not only good practice for you and it builds up your own mental library, it also makes your work look professional because it looks like you've done your research on what you're drawing, right? So, uh, a lion, uh, there's a couple of nostrils. This is much too, this is going out of my page, so I'm going to need to, oops, I'm going to need to um, resize my drawing so it stays within the borders. Okay, so uh, I will keep sketching and then I will end up with something like this. And I did the same thing for the other page. Yeah, this is going to be a pain to paint, but you know, we all suffer for art. Uh, so at this point, I can start painting. Um, and because I've seen a lot of tutorials out there already of lined art um, tutorials, I'm going to choose to show you guys uh, painting lineless, which has its own pros and cons compared to lined art. With, um, I think I said it, I set the automatic saving at every 15 minutes because I have so, I've had so many um, incidents where I lost all our work because I forgot to save. So I let the computer do it for me now. Okay, so lined art, um, I I tend to prefer lineless art, I think, because you can just be so much more abstract with your shapes. Like, if you look at this, like, you know this is a hand, but when I do lined art, um, I think I just become so caught up with the details that it um, makes my workflow very inefficient. So quite often I would just go with um, lineless painting and it's like not that different. You kind of make sure you just, you just draw a um, shape, you line out the shapes and then once you have that done, you just fill it and then you fill in any, any um, white spots that you miss. So you just go through the whole page like this. Um, and afterwards, I will end up with something like, oh, this is all done. I will end up with something like this. Backgrounds, I usually go last. So this is um, probably three hours of work at this point, I would say. Um, I focus on all of the uh, the main characters first, and then let me just show you what I've, uh, some things that I've done here. So if you can see on the right side, I've color coded a lot of these layers. And this is because um, it will be very useful later when you transform this into a web webtoon format. Uh, one thing I just want to emphasize is when you're drawing comics, layer organization is so important, um, especially when you want to, you know, change the format later. Uh, yeah, you can be a little bit more loose when you're doing illustrations or, I don't know, a graphic design or something, but for comics, um, I've learned the hard way that you really need to keep your layers organized. So I've grouped them into individual uh, objects. Like for example, these two characters, um, it's all this peach uh, colored layers. Um, this is the layer below, like everything is in its own um, groups. Uh, for something like this, where they are popped out of the panel, um, what I did was, uh, so I basically just, 
I painted these whole um, and then I just copy and pasted uh, this area of the arts outside of the of the panel so it looks like it pops up okay now that that's all done uh, I'm gonna show you the background process so this was the original sketch that I had done it's obviously not enough information for me to go off of to immediately start painting so I need to do a more detailed pass of uh, the background so this was the second stage of my um, background uh, process. Now I drew these as though these panels didn't exist. Yeah, that's the other thing. When I'm drawing comics and I know I'm going to be uh, changing this to webtoon format, I draw everything through, meaning I just pretend that panels don't exist and things that are hidden behind panels, I'm still drawing them out completely as though this was one illustration. So now that I have the sketch, I feel confident enough to start painting. And yes, I will get something like this. At this point, I would say this is about six hours of work. Um, and yeah, let, let me go over a couple more things. One thing I like to do uh, before I feel this is finished is I would add like a layer. I would fill it with like completely black. And then I would turn this on color mode. So this turns the whole illustration into grayscale value mode. It's really useful to see um, just overall how your illustration works. Uh, I will zoom out to make sure that, you know, however angle that you look at this image, it still reads, right? Nothing's blending into each other. Um, for this guy, I actually added, like you see the little faded, oops, the faded um, kind of glow here. Um, this is because if I took this off and you look at it in grayscale mode, like this blends in, right? It looks kind of messy. So I add a bit of glow to kind of um, make the, make certain objects stand out. I think I did it with the background as well. Um, let me, let me see. Yeah. So I added a bit of, added a bit of fade behind the lion dancers as well to make them pop out. Okay, so I feel like this is done. Then I add the, uh, then I add the, um, the script bubbles. So there's some information that I need the audience to, to know when they're reading through this page, right? You look at this page and you're like, you're not 100% sure what's happening. So I need to give that information to the audience through my speech bubbles. So uh, I'm just thinking, okay, if he's ticklish, how would his partner not know? Because they've been practicing for so long. This is such an important um, problem that guy A has. So I would think that, okay, maybe he's a new partner and he's substituted last minute. So I would have one bubble here talking about um, Guy, Guy B is a substitute, right? So something about him being a substitute. Um, another bubble here to say that he has a problem and that he didn't tell Guy A, or sorry, tell Guy B, and then this is the punchline that he's, you know, ticklish. This kind of a crude lead up to the punchline. Um, but uh, this this works for the demo. So the reason I placed the bubbles in the way that I did is because I want to lead your eye through the page the way I want you to look at the, um, the illustration. So I know that when you first look at this image, your eye goes straight to the top left corner. I think this is probably because of the way the line is drawn, like this 
costume is looking at this side of the page. And this line is probably the first thing that you notice. So I want to also start the speech here. And next thing I want you to look at is these two characters, right? So I will place the bubble here to make you um, have to go over uh, the lion dancers. Afterwards, obviously, I need your eyes to go through this way. Um, I think your eyes will naturally go in this direction. So I will just place the bubbles in the, uh, in the way. And once that is planned, I will go and add the text. And that's what the uh, finished page will look like. So the bubbles here, uh, these are thought bubbles. And what I use for thought bubbles is um, you go over to the toolbar. There's the balloon where you can draw the speech bubbles. And there's also the flash. So I use the flash, the sea urchin flash. Um, like the panel bar, um, the top color is the color of your border and the uh, bottom color is the color of the content. So I chose the dark brown color as usual. Oh, I did turn the panels into a white border color. Uh, that's because I think, I think it looks better. I think it pops up more. Um, if it was a dark brown color, I feel like it would just, you know, I mean, it still looks fine. It's a stylistic choice at this point, but I chose white. Um, and then I did the same thing for the other page, right? Uh, these characters are drawn out of panel. Um, I kind of wanted to reflect that since this part of their performance is off script, it's kind of reflected in the fact that these characters are going outside the panels. And then we end up with uh, a finished page like this. Um, one thing I want to take note of is that the background here is basically copy pasted from this. Yeah, so when you're drawing comics, don't be afraid to reuse and copy paste your own work. Um, especially if you have uh, like a serial ongoing regularly updated comic like I do, you just don't have time to redraw things. Um, and I don't think pe most people would notice anyway, even if they do, it's not a big deal because the focus of the story is the characters, right? The, the plot, the, the story, not the background art. Um, obviously you don't want to, you know, copy paste too much that it becomes, um, too noticeable and distracting, but this short comic, it's not really a big deal in the same angle. So why wouldn't I use the uh, background? The only thing I changed was like, I added these characters clapping, you know, just in case people's eyes wander to the background and it's like a little Easter egg for them. Uh, so at this point, I'm, I feel pretty confident about saying I'm done with this. So now I can turn this into a web tuna format. And this is where uh, my color coded layers come into really good use. So let's uh, first make a file that's in webtoon format. Um, so it's the second option here. Um, you know, as usual, name your file, make sure that the file is in the correct folder. And as for the width, um, Webtoon, I think, is standardized at 800 pixels wide. But I've also seen some other platforms use up to 1200 pixels. Um, and, you know, you always want to leave yourself some flexible room. So I usually just go with 1200. Uh, paper color, white, yes. Um, I know I want two pages for the two pages of comics we have here. And after uh, we are all happy with this, I click um, OK, and you will get a file that looks like this. You can always add more um, pages by right-clicking here and 
you know, you add a new page. Um, my computer's, computer's a bit slow, but yeah, so you got three pages. It's really cool that Clip Studio splits up your window like this. So you have your working area and a zoomed out version so you can see how your comic looks overall. Um, for the purpose of this demo, it'll be easier for me to actually just um, combine everything to one panel. Okay. So now we go back to the page that I want converted into a webtoon. So now you see all of these color-coded groups. And okay, so make sure you save this first. And then you can go ahead and merge the layers that you color-coded. Like so. Um, Okay, so everything I need is its own element, right? This is going to make my life really easy. So the first panel I want in the webtoon is the background uh, with the line answers. So copy and paste. Um, the thing about translating a traditional web page format into a webtoon format is that, you know, since these are two completely different formats, the translation isn't going to be perfect. So you will need to do some, uh, like, noodling. So for this, uh, I want all of the sky to extend up to the top. So I do need to... Um, change the art just a little bit so that it's suitable for this different format. You know, make it seamless. So now you can't tell that um, there used to be a line here, right? Then I take the next element I need. Um, yeah, this part is, it, it depends on my mood, um, it's a bit tedious, but it's also kind of fun at the same time, because it's like putting on a um, comic, or no, <laughs> putting together a puzzle. Uh, okay, so obviously I made a mistake here, because I need this guy's feet to land on the stilts. Yeah, so there's a bit of work, like very easy work involved, but um, most of the work has already been done, right? So now uh, you just go through and add in your elements one at a time. Yeah, it feels a bit like real work. So, yeah, you just keep going, um, make sure everything flows nicely, and then you will uh, end up with Yeah, so you will end up with something like this. So on the right, oh, sorry, left side, you can see my completed webtoon. Uh, after I finish, I usually, you know, read it to make sure everything flows nicely. There's no uh, typos. Um, this part was a little bit hard to translate. Because it works in the traditional page, you can tell, you know, he's flying through the uh, panels. But I guess for the webtoon, um, what I did was, so let me just show you. In the traditional page, uh, he's flying through the panels, right? But for this, because I can't show that, I copy-pasted this guy twice. 
So he shows up in every panel. So these are some of the changes that you have to make to make sure that your comic will fit the, um, the format that you have and it reads. Um, and then for the next page, yeah, next page, something like this. And I think it works out. Okay. So now that that's done, oh no, cancel. Um, I can go ahead and um, export my page, you know, and upload it onto Webtoon if you want. Uh, let's see what else if I missed. Um, since we have a bit more time, I'm just going to go over uh, a bit more about my process for doing lineless art. Um, I actually made a mistake here. Usually I try to group things into as many layers as I can. Uh, so, for example, um, I draw this through. Yeah, the, the great thing about lineless art is I don't have to worry about coloring within lines because whatever edge that you just erase, that becomes a new line. And then that's the shirt. So, um, like, you know, what if I wanted to make him uh, wear tank tops or something like that. Then if I had painted this guy through, I don't need to, um, like I, I wouldn't need to change the line art again and then, you know, recolor everything. I can just do some erasing and get what I want. Same thing for uh, every, like for everything else. Um, if I show you my art layer for, um, let me undo all of the grouping that I've done. Yeah, so you see everything has its own layer, like, uh, yeah, I mean, there's some, obviously I got some of the layers mixed up, uh, but every object, I try to make its own layer. It's just easier to edit later. Um, even the, I think the background, I also, uh, yeah. I try, I think this is a habit from work, but I don't really merge things as much as I can because um, leaving things separate, you just give yourself um, a room to be able to change things later. And so, Um, at the end of everything, um, I do draw on top to uh, make sure, you know, just like some highlights here and there, like this highlight. Oh, I guess I merged it. Yeah. I think that's it. I think that's the... That's everything I want to talk about. Um, yeah, so that is basically the end of my demo.
Um, yeah. Hi, January. You yes. want me to go through the Q&A part now? Yeah, sure. Awesome, uh, awesome. Yeah, thank you guys for uh, listening to this webinar. I hope you guys got something out of it. They got it, they loved it, and there's so many people watching us right now. And we asked from where are you watching? There's people watching like really early in the morning, depending on the time zone, people from the United States, South California, North California, Mexico, Poland, Norway, Ecuador, Indonesia, wow. Mexico, Brazil, United Kingdom. I'm just reading the comments here. Ukraine, uh, Pennsylvania, California, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Germany, Italy, Philippines, uh, Hungary, uh, Finland, Colombia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sorry if I miss a country, South Africa, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So thank you all who are watching us right now. There are so many questions, uh, but let's start with uh, something related with with you as an artist. What are your references, inspirations? Oh yeah, sure. Um, my ref my inspiration comes from pretty much everywhere. Uh, you get the most information when you open your mind to the whole world. So, um, you know, when I go out for walks, I do <laughs> exercise. Um, you know, I would see maybe light hitting a tree really nicely and that would be very inspiring to me. Um, you know, social media is actually a pretty big one for me. Um, I look at other artists' work, um, see other people's styles, and you know, there's things that they do that I feel, oh my God, I wanna try. So I would try to bring that um, into my own work. I don't take, you know, directly from other artists' work. I just take the, um, you know, the, their color logic or um, their line styles or something like that. And I try to see um, uh, what part of it I can bring into enhancing my own work. Um, I also take a lot of inspiration, as you can see from, you know, this comic that I've done, uh, like uh, Chinese cultural stuff because I'm Chinese and um, so I watch a lot of, you know, Chinese dramas. Um, yeah, and there's some really, really great stories out there. Um, the costumes, the, you know, set design in those, in those dramas are also really inspiring to me. Yeah, so basically, you know, everywhere that you can, um, you can think of, just open your mind up to, to, uh, to everything you see and you will find inspiration. That's awesome. Well, actually, there's something that you just mentioned, and this is a question from Karen Chan. How much uh, research do you do for your comics to feel comfortable in representing cultures and time periods? Uh, I most of the time, um, because I'm most familiar with you know Chinese culture, uh, I draw a lot of stuff you know in Chinese culture. Um, regarding Chinese culture. And for for that, you know, I have, like my parents are wealth of information about Chinese culture, so I ask them questions. Um, you know, Chinese social media, I can't really read Chinese that well, but I know enough to be able to use Chinese social media to um, look up things that I need, like costumes. Um, as for time periods, I've never really tried to be 100% accurate because Chinese cultural dynasties, there's just so many. And um, honestly, most dramas and stories out there by Chinese people, they're not totally accurate either. There's a lot of, you know, um, artistic liberties taken. So that's what I do. As for other cultures, um, I usually ask people who I know are part of the culture. Um, like I have friends from, you know, all sorts of different cultures. So I try to get my information from them. Um, online research, uh, if there's something I don't know, I usually just don't try to draw it, you know, um, until I feel confident that I know enough. Um, but if you look at most of my comics, they're kind of like pretty fantasy, 
you know for those ones i don't need to do a lot of research at all i just um draw whatever comes to my mind so yeah i hope that suffices as an answer yes uh, and that's a good bridge for a question from gabriela vasquez she says uh, what do you do uh, to stop an art block oh that's hard i think it there's everyone's different i think this is the one uh one of those things where everyone probably needs to find their own solution for me personally um i have this problem where if i take a break from drawing let's say i'm like okay two days i'm just gonna rest from drawing i find it harder to go back to drawing so when i have art breaks or, or sorry, um uh, art blocks, I just do small sketches of, of things I like drawing, you know, very easy little arts works. Like for example, um, I would say, you know, this drawing was kind of like a, something I did during art block. I like, I really love drawing mermaids and that's something that I don't really need to use my brain for. So I just kind of, uh, draw the things I like. I think after a while, I will pick up momentum again. Um, and then I can start, you know, creating a bit more involved work, like like uh, these illustrations. Um, but again, everyone's different. I, you really need to, you, sorry, you really need to take breaks as well. Um, I feel that art blocks come more frequently when you, um, push yourself too hard. So in order to, you know, prevent art blocks happening, um, you just want to take frequent break breaks during your regular routine. Yeah, yeah. Keep your brain well rested so that it has room to take inspiration when it comes. Um, That's uh, yeah. great advice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here's a more web to related questions. Alice, Alice Sui, and she says, why not draw the comic as web to format to begin with? Is there a reason for doing the web, the comic on an A4 page format first? Sorry if I missed this explanation at the beginning. Oh yeah, no worries. Um, so the reason I, so the question was, I why do I start with a traditional page format, right? Yep. Um, that's because it's easier to go from a traditional page format to a webtoon than it is the other way around. So like imagine if you were to draw these panels and you wanted to, you know, put it back into put it into a traditional page format. It's I don't there's a lot of drawing involved, there's a lot of formatting involved. It might not even work um, because of the way that you uh panel the the artwork. Right? Like can you imagine fitting these panels into a uh traditional page format? It's like uh I wouldn't know where to begin. So, but the other way around, like clearly these panels, you can stack them up down the webtoon format. Um, that's actually the only reason I start with the traditional page format is because it's just easier and it gives me flexibility for future me if I ever wanna change formats from one to the other. Mm -hmm. And here's another interesting question from Iris Grimoire. Um, how to measure the right amount of white or color between panels when moving from page to a scroll format? Oh, like, um, sorry, let me open this. That's, um, that's kind of subjective. I, I noodle around this a lot. Like, I fidget with my webtoon so much because I just feel like, you know, oh, the spaces are too much or too little. Um, so usually after I place everything out, I just place everything out at once. And then I look, I read through it myself. I feel like, oh, the pacing's off. Um, maybe, you know, these are too close together. So then I will make it further apart. Um, but if I feel like, oh, 
you know, the beat here is too long, then I just drag everything closer. So it kind of just feels like what works for the flow of your story. Um, you know, I feel like for this, there should be a bit of a gap here because, um, you know, this this was the punchline. So what's the next punchline? Well, there's going to be a little bit of a um, a gap between the two uh, two events. But I think the general rule of thumb is, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, there's no general rule of thumb. It's just what flows right. If you read a lot of webtoons, I think that you will kind of gain an innate sense of the flow of panels, which you can, which will just automatically come out when you're doing your own webtoons. Um, yeah. Okay, and there's a, a more general question that, that is being repeated in some of uh, people's doubts, like, uh, what are your favorite uh, brushes and if you're using a tablet device? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I am using uh, a Wacom Cintiq. Uh, this, this is just the standard, um, the standard hardware for uh, work in the industry where I'm located, a Wacom Cintiq. And um, brushes, uh, I've like, all of these brushes here, I've kind of just collected over the years. I've bought some, others friends and coworkers gave me. Um, and I honestly don't remember where most of them come from, but my favorite sketching is this kind of a pencil uh, textured brush. It, it kind of is like, you know, slanted. So, you know, you can do some really nice, uh, handwriting with it um, and because it's slanted like I can have thin lines or I can have thick lines depending how how I angle my pencil or pen for um, oh this is another good one uh, this one I think is free in the clip studio uh, store it's called su cream pencil and for painting um, I really like this brush. It's a little bit like your regular, um, you know, round brush, but it's it has a little bit of a elliptical shape to it, um, and it has a really nice um, sensitivity to give you the right amount of fade that I want. So yeah, those are the three pen, uh, brushes that I normally use. Oh, sorry, and also this one. This one I think I made like years and years and years ago. Um, and I think I have a sentimental attachment to this. So uh, I, I use, actually I use this brush to um, block in most of my work here. Like if you can tell, yeah. Yeah, so those four brushes, everything else here, they're like for effects, you know, my cloud pencil, um, this uh, Devon, oh, I can't pull this out, but yeah. So Devon L. Kurtz plant brushes, this set is totally free. I use it a lot for my foliage painting. Um, yeah, so basically just, you know, keep an eye out for, uh, trying out different brushes and then you will end up collecting this this massive collection like I have. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, related to another question. Um, if you download a lot of materials or from the asset store uh, from Clip Studio Paint. Sorry? If you download uh, assets or materials from Clip Studio Paint uh, website or you rather basically just do it on your own? Oh, um, both. Uh, there's some really good stuff that the community shares for free um, uh, or you, you know, pay with coins, whatever. Just 
and I also, you know, sometimes I can't find exactly what I want, so I would create my own, um, create my own brushes. Like, uh, I think, let me show you this. Oh. Yeah, so this was a brush that I created. So I, um, my current webcomic for like this webcomic, there are some scenes that have a lot of lily, lily pads and I, I don't want to draw a hundred thousand with lily pads. So I created this brush. And yeah, so this obviously repetition, but I've added enough different variations that it's not super obvious when you, um, when you first look at it. Uh, other brushes, you know, um, I know I've, you know, I've definitely bought quite a few brushes here too. Just uh, basically whatever would enhance my own art um, works for me. That's awesome. And also, um, also related to another popular questions, like how did you find your own art style? Yeah, that's the age old question. Um, <laughs> I'm still looking for my art style and I don't know if I'll ever find it, to be honest. Like if you look at this, I just, maybe to some people, this looks like a art style, but for me, this looks like, I don't know, three different people painted this. It's an ongoing process. Um, I don't really have an answer, but the best I can come up with is, um, for me, style is the process uh, you use to arrive at your final art. And so my process is, you know, it's always changing. I use different process for different types of styles or art that I do. Um, so I look at a lot of tutorials by artists that I like. Um, they will show you their process and, you know, sometimes I will see some of the steps that they do and I'm like, that's a really good, that's a really good, um, idea and I would try to bring that into my own art and so then my process evolves again and so it's always changing uh, I just look at a lot of artists that I like um, you know take photos of the way uh, of the way light changes things like that um, basically you find a process of drawing that feels comfortable to you. I think that's the closest thing that you can define as your style. And here's another question. Vini has been very insistent. So how do you deal with negative feedback? Oh, negative feedback. Um, when, when you're working in the industry, like you're, you're like actually designing stuff for clients, um you kind of have to deal with negative feedback all the time which uh you know it's it just i'm kind of used to it if you're talking about negative feedback for like uh like you know like hate or something or online uh comments saying your art looks bad or something like that um it can feel bad i know it does but um i think you have to come to a point where your own opinion of your artwork has to be the most important if you're not working for a client you know if you're working for a client their opinion is the most important but if you're drawing your own art and you're doing art for yourself the most important opinion should be yourself and so if you feel like i don't agree with this guy then you can just ignore it um it's a little hard to do to just say ignore it uh but um you know, when you get a lot of negative comments like that, you really do just kind of get used to it. Um, you just, you know, reaffirm yourself by drawing things you like, you know, feel good about your own arts. Um, and, you know, maybe even talk to other artists' friends or friends that you have uh, if you, if it really affects you. But um, yeah, just don't care about those people. Uh, just keep doing what you want to do. Awesome. Thank you for that great advice. And actually, time is running up uh, and we're getting close to the end of our webinar. But if we can close with this 
also tip or recommendation for, for somebody who's starting into web comic, what would you say uh, to webtoon comics and what would you say to them? Uh, if you're just starting out with, if you're just starting out doing comics um, and webtoons, I would say start small, you know, like, uh, like a short comic um, feel, test the waters. How do you do with, um, you know, because creating comics is, it's like a marathon. You have to have kind of the discipline and the willpower. Sometimes there's low low points where you're like, I don't want to draw this anymore. I want to, I want to do something new. Um, so you don't want to, you know, plan out a whole Lord of the Rings epic right from the start. Uh, so my comic, Ripley and the Waiting, that was only supposed to be like a 10 chaptered story. I had a sh very short plot. I just wanted to test out how I would feel doing comics. You will realize very soon that you will want to keep expanding the story to add more details and naturally you will end up with like a 20 page or 20 chapter comic so always start small in a small uh short story with very few characters and then you can just let it grow afterwards after you've done a lot of those you will start feeling more comfortable starting uh doing bigger and bigger stories so yeah that's that's my um that's my advice. Just you know, start small. Start with short stories with uh, a few characters, and then work from there. Well, we're wrapping up with those wise words. So thank you so much, uh, January, for this amazing presentation. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is the first time I've done anything like this. So um, yeah, it was really fun. No, you rocked, and thank you all for attending today to January's presentation. Before we leave, uh, let me just share one last bit of information. Uh, learn more about Clip Studio Paint in our website, clipstudio.net forward slash n, and also graphically.com. For some of you who so want to like watch it again, or if you want to share this amazing webinar with your friends, uh, remember to follow us and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Clip Studio Paint channel, and Graphically. This uh, webinar has been recorded, so if you're subscribed, you'll receive a notification when it's ready to watch. And also for more information about January and her art, uh, just follow her on her social media, Instagram, JS, JSR, and Twitter, JSR, and also on her website, JanuarySunArt.com. So with that, again, thank you so much, uh, January. Thank you, Mario, for uh, for this amazing <laughs> um, introduction to me. No, it's it's been a pleasure, and everybody loved your webinar. So please stay tuned for more events like this in the future. So once again, thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.